Hi, Chris. Thanks for the interview. Could you start off by explaining your background and work? Well, I'm a person who grew up mostly in the Bay Area since I was 10 and uh, came to San Francisco when I was 20 in 1978, moved to the Haight-Ashbury, and uh, had a, a sort of a underground life as a radical organizer around dissenting office workers. We had an underground magazine called Processed World <clears throat> that we published from 1981 to 1994, three times a year, sort of as a labor, always as a labor of love. We had no money and we just would put together this beautiful magazine several times a year. And in it, we discussed the stupidity of modern work. That's essentially what it was about. It was about the, the emptiness of uh, the life that we were living, going downtown to San Francisco's financial district, which we generally referred to as an abusement park. And, um, you know, you have to sell yourself for wages in this society, and that we were quite cognizant of that being an empty ritual that didn't allow us to participate in deciding how we should live. And so the magazine was full of satire and poetry and fiction and, and just blistering political analysis and all this kind of stuff. So I did that for many years of my life and um, filled up most of the 1980s. I also had a daughter in 1984, so that became part of my life as well. And then um, by the early 90s, the magazine had kind of run out of steam. Sort of interestingly, right around the same time as the internet took off, like when the World Wide Web kicks in, the magazine disappeared. And it had always been a magazine about the underside of the information age, as told by the alienated wage slaves of the modern office. So it was sort of somewhat ironic that we would disappear right around the time that the internet became a common presence in people's lives. It has been rediscovered lately. There's been several articles about it in uh, other journals from just in the last few years. So uh, that came to a, a logical end. And while, that, while it was sort of starting to wind down in the early 90s, of course, we had the Gulf War, and there was a lot of protests and you know, contestation in the streets around the Gulf War, the first one, that is. We're still having the second one, which is now dragging on for quite a long time. And um, <clears throat> during that period of time, it turns out, interestingly enough, people spontaneously began to use bicycles in demonstrations. And I wasn't doing that, but I was a daily bicyclist and had been throughout the 1980s. And I had always been sort of agitating with friends, like, why don't we actually do something about bicycling? You know, like, what well, seems so obvious, we should be asserting ourselves. And if nothing else, we should at least demand our rights. Like, we're treated like, you know, children on the streets. People yell at us, get a job when you're riding a bike, as though there's some connection with being <laughs> a scofflaw and an unemployed person or something. I don't know. It just didn't make any sense. It still doesn't when it happens today. So uh, in the right around um, spring of 92, there was a sort of this gelling started to happen. I had an office at 7th and Market at the Grant Building, and we had a lot of people hanging out there. It was a kind of a hangout zone. Had been a political kind of clubhouse for the magazine project, and that was still going at the time. <clears throat> and then this, there was a lot of bike messengers passing through, too, to hang out, and um, a lot of beer drinking and pot smoking going on. And so we started talking about more and more what could we do to sort of politicize our commitment to a radical ecological alternative way of life. And the fact is we're already doing it. Many of us ride a bike every day. Why, why shouldn't we assert ourselves? And so out of this clouds of smoke and enthusiastic discussion, we finally decided let's just go to the foot of Market Street on the last Friday of the month and ride home together in a group. And that became critical mass. And critical mass turned into a global phenomenon. It spread all over the world within a few years. It was in hundreds of cities around the planet. And it's since the early 90s, we've had a, maybe a 20-fold increase in daily bicycling in San Francisco and equal mag magnificently large increases in bicycling in many, many cities of the world. And some rudimentary infrastructure has appeared. We have the bike sharing programs, all pretty much terrible. But anyway, that's what we got. And so uh, the bicycle, the politics around bicycling and alternative transportation became a big part of my life for a number of years. And it, to this day, I still am <laughs> treated as what I like to call a sub-liberty in Latin America. I go to this World Bike Forum most last few years in Mexico City and in Lima, Peru, and in two cities in Brazil and Chile, Santiago, Chile, where I give a speech. And it's always lately been the same kind of general thrust to say, look, you guys, you still love each other. You still have all this solidarity around bicycling. That's great. But you have to have a broader agenda. Because here in San Francisco, we've already had the experience of having had the, we're the mecca for critical mass bicycles. Everybody wants to come here because they think it's the best in the world. And they get here, and they're always like, oh, <laughs> well, it's not that great here, is it? And whatever happened to critical mass? Well, it still goes. It's kind of a zombie ride. but. Um, the fact is, is that the bike culture died. 
in San Francisco. There was a very dynamic bike culture here in the 90s and into the early 2000s, and it's for the most part dead. And there's still some pieces of it floating around. But there was a higher sense of kind of connectedness and unity that a lot of people experienced from that. And I think in many, most cities in the South, in the global South, they still feel that way. They feel really excited because they're all on bicycles. It's like, great. But guess what? If you get everybody on a bicycle, your culture will vanish under your feet. So you need to start thinking about having a broader political agenda. And then lastly, I, in 1994, after Processed World had been folded, uh, I started brainstorming and I came up with this idea with my friends that because we had encountered over and over again in the streets, we used to sell the magazine in the streets wearing strange costumes. We had like video display terminal heads and tied detergent boxes and planters peanut cans, but all with satirical writing on them. And so bound, gagged, and tied to useless work day in, day out for the rest of your life. Or IBM, intensely boring machines, you know, stuff like that. And so we would meet people on the streets at, the, at lunchtime on Fridays. That's how we met a lot of the readers and writers of the magazine throughout the 1980s. And then in um, the common experience over and over again was we'd meet people coming out of their office on a Friday in a daze, and they're just like, what do you mean? You, you know, there's something wrong. I, of course, the world's horrible, but it's always been like this, and it'll always be this way. This is just the way it is. Get used to it. And it was like, well, wait a minute. Actually, no, this is a very specific moment in history. There weren't temps. There weren't all these temps working before. Now there are. They won't be here in five or 10 years because they'll reorganize production again, and things will change. And actually looking at things historically was became more and more important to me. And I realized that I was living in a profoundly amnesiac society. And so part of my mission became trying to address that. In fact, trying to uh, you know rebuke it in a pretty direct way. So out of that came, in the, in the mid-90s in town, there was this huge buzz going on, sort of like what you get now for apps. Back then it was all about interactive multimedia. It was going to change everything. And it was all about how you're gonna never have any more radio or television or books or newspapers or anything. It's all gonna be on CD-ROMs. <laughs> and so everybody knew eventually the internet would handle that capacity, but in the 90s that wasn't yet the case. And so many people were, were coming up with these new game ideas. So there was Myst and there was SimCity and there was these various other games. So originally our pondering how to do something about history involved a game scenario. I won't bore you with the details, but we spent 18 months trying to develop that. It didn't work out, and we finally realized we were already developing such an interesting, complicated, nonlinear history of San Francisco that we would be better off just going with that and forget this whole artificial game scenario on top of it with points and things to do that were just kind of arbitrary and weird. And so we gave up on the game, and we proceeded with the project, and we came out with our first edition in 1998, at the beginning of 1998, at the same time that we published our first book with City Lights. We now have three books, there's a fourth one on the way, and we've gone through many editions of our digital project, and since 2009 it's been open online as an archive called uh, foundsf.org is the, the URL. And it's the Shaping San, Fr Shaping San Francisco is the project, and Shaping San Francisco consists not only of the digital archive at Found SF, but also we have uh, an ongoing public talk series, so we have 12 years of public talks piled up as audio archives and last two years video archives. We've done a lot of oral history gathering. We've done special projects. One of them was called Ecology Emerges, where we traced the whole arc of ecological activism from the 50s to the present, sort of starting with conservation and ending with environmental and social justice movements of today. Uh, all that's online. It's all mostly available for people to use for free. It's, it's open source kind of thing. And um, we also carry on tours through the city, we take people on walking tours and bike tours through the city all the time. So I, I wear a lot of hats. I don't get paid hardly anything to do any of it. Luckily, I have a nice house that I don't pay very much for. Because my goal was always to keep my overhead very low. It's part of why I was a bicyclist. Like, I don't need to own a car. That's a huge waste of money. Why would I own a car? And um, so the strategy of holding my overhead down has allowed me to do interesting, creative, politically edgy work without worrying about remuneration. And that has kept me a f pretty free human being since I was about 23. I'm now 61. Um, so right now we're in the Mission, which is a very socially engaged and culturally charged neighborhood. Could you describe like the personality of this neighborhood in particular? Well, the Mission District has a, a lot of reputations laying on top of each other. <laughs> And it's partly because of all the different kinds of people that live here. And there are many different populations that live side by side, cheek by jowl, and don't even know that the other group is right next to them, living in the same place. 
So just a few blocks from here, we have day laborers who only recently crossed the desert who are trying to find day, daytime work, mostly don't speak any English. Uh, over here on the corner of Shotwell and 24th, uh, until quite recently, we had a regular heroin and crack dealing going on and posting up. And then there's another gang at 24th and, and uh, Hampshire who's in competition and they occasionally have shootouts. And this is that's part of the neighborhood. Meanwhile, we have a, had a giant demographic shift in the last 10 years where this enormous amount of money has moved into the neighborhood. And we have a tremendously large number of uh, luxury condominiums that have been built and many more in the pipeline. Uh, if you look at the census tracts for the, the mission, which is, you know, I should say, first of all, the mission doesn't have a clear boundary like every neighborhood in San Francisco. There was a time in 1909 when there was a group founded called the Mission Promotion Association, which were essentially Irish businessmen who saw the neighborhood as theirs, and it mostly was Irish and German at the time and Italian. And they had a map of the mission that extended from what our common sense of the mission is all the way to the shore, to, to Pier 70, and all the way to the southern border of the city. That was all the mission as far as they were concerned. They had the whole, half the city. So they, they saw themselves as a <laughs> fairly imperial project. Uh, and in those days, there was a, you know, a very large Irish community living in, this, in the neighborhood who were very involved in Irish liberation. And they were, had many organizations in town, clandestine and above ground, who were raising money to buy arms to send to Ireland to fight the British. And so that was part of the, the history of the mission back then. Uh, starting in the 30s, you started having an influx of Central Americans. A large number of Central Americans started to arrive. Uh, the first real in numbers. There had always been some because of the, the coffee trade and the banana trade, and there was a lot of longshoremen and seamen who would land here and decide to stay. Uh, but as you got the 30s, there was the Matanza in El Salvador, and you had the Civil War in Nicaragua, and both of those led to influxes of refugees coming here who settled mostly along in the northern part of the neighborhood, uh, the North Mission, where there was a lot of Scandinavians also at that time. And the Latino neighborhood in San Francisco during that era was primarily over in North Beach around the Guadalupe Church, right about where the Broadway Tunnel is today. Just above it is where the Guadalupe Church is, and that was the, the center of the Latino neighborhood well into the 40s. So by the 50s, you start seeing a shift. People start moving a little bit because some sorts of early gentrification started happening in North Beach, although it had a long way to go yet. That was the period of the beats. <clears throat> so, so suddenly you start having this, this migration of Lat Latinos towards the mission district to the point where by the early 60s, you'd had such an influx that they started, they changed the masses at St. Peter's down here from English to Spanish, which really upset the Irish and Italians. They were like, what are you doing? And they were still driving from the sunset into the mission to go to their church. And there was a lot of conflict and, and stuff associated with that. Um, so now you're in the 1960s and the neighborhood becomes strongly identified with, with the, the new Latino population and then there's the rise of third worldist politics, especially around the strike at San Francisco State in 68, 69. Uh, you have this um, rather important legal case that happens when uh, two policemen try to shake down these young men who are unloading furniture into a house up on Alvarado Street. Today we would call it Noe Valley, but in 1969 that was still considered the mission. And uh, <clears throat> these two cops, they all knew each other, the kids, the young men and the, the cops, and they ended up getting into a scuffle and one of the cops' guns goes off and it kills the other cop. And the seven young men were all accused of murdering him. And they had a very political trial that went on for a year and a half. And in the end, they were acquitted. One of them escaped to Cuba and never came back, but the other ones were on trial and they were acquitted. And so that was a really dramatic moment. They were called Los Siete de la Raza. And then you had these series of community groups formed to do support work for them and create kind of community activism around them. And so that legacy of that moment still reverberates through time and, and still influences a lot of people's psychology. You also had the rise of what was called the Mission Coalition Organization, which was the largest grassroots mobilization in any city anywhere in the United States ever of community groups joining together in a large coalition, over 120 groups. And they had this really elaborate structure was like I don't know, 17 different vice presidents and they had to represent every ethnic group so from Samoans to African Americans to Mexicans, Nicaraguans, El Salvador, <laughs> everybody had to have their own vice president in the group and uh, they were very effective for the first couple of years doing sort of direct action demonstrations following a Saul Alinsky style pol political model of, of community mo mobilization to get achievable goals. 
and they would put pressure on local businesses. We had a lot of industry at that point. You still had the beer breweries in the Northeast Mission. You had the Twinkies factory making Twinkies and Ho-Hos, uh, the Kirkpatrick bread factory. You had the Hellman's mayonnaise, the best foods mayonnaise company was over here making mayonnaise with clouds of ammonia every night in the middle of the night going out from there. You had trains running through the Mission on Harrison Street. So it was a very industrial neighborhood in those days, and the MCO was able to extract job jobs and, and uh, also do tenant defense work that nobody else was doing that much during the time. I mean, the Mission Tenants Union had started it, and they took it up. So that also was a galvanizing experience, and a great many of today's nonprofits in the neighborhood can trace their roots to that moment. They were founded during that period of time, and one of the reasons they were founded is because as a way of co-opting this organization, the mayor at the time, Joe Alioto, received all this federal money. When Nixon got elected, he changed the, uh, the system of providing money from federal government to local cities, and they created this new program called Model Cities, and every city in the country got Model Cities money. And in San Francisco's case, o Alioto decided to allocate most of the Model Cities money to the mission, and he had to find a partner to work with in the mission. He decided, he decided after some fraught political moments to work with the MCO. So suddenly the MCO is the broker that can decide how to spend millions of dollars. And it leads to the organization just going <laughs> over a couple of years. They basically couldn't, couldn't sustain it. But as I mentioned, many of the nonprofits that we have today, whether it's the Centro Legal de la Raza or um, the Centro Familiar de la Raza, a lot of these groups, the Horizons Unlimited, um, Arriba Juntos, there's a lot of groups that got their start th during that period of time with that founding, r those founding resources and the founding political energy. And so that gave a, a real imprint to, this, to the neighborhood, as well as the fact that you had a great cultural upheaval during that time. You had, you know, of course, the music. Carlos Santana lived just a few blocks from here. They would play free concerts in the streets, which was part of a phenomenon going on all over the city in Haight-Ashbury and the Hay Baby Hunters Point, et cetera. It wasn't unique to the mission. Um, you had the muralist movement beginning during that time, so it started off with men, and then suddenly you had these mujeres muralistas saying, what do you mean we can't paint? Of course we can paint. We don't need men to tell us what to do. We can do it ourselves. And so they started painting in Balmy Alley and um, created a kind of a, a, a point of attraction for other women to get excited about joining in with that. And many of them were associated with the Art Institute and other art schools around. And so there was a lot of sort of ferment and overlap between politics, culture, uh, social welfare organizing, political organizing, labor organizing, all this stuff was going on all, all at once. And of all the students who had been radicalized at the strike in San Francisco State were re-entering political movements in the neighborhood as well. So that's the 70s, you know, you're in the 70s when all that's going on. And then you get to the 80s, and by the 79 is the Nicaraguan Revolution, Sandinista Revolution, and then the Sandinistas have been organizing in the mission. Mo most of the Sandinista directorate who led the revolution in Nicaragua, they lived here in this neighborhood, and they went back to make the revolution. And a lot of people joined them. And some of them were training on Bernal Heights, just the hill right up here behind us. They were going around the hill <laughs> all day long trying to get in shape to go and have a revolution. And so the, the Nicaraguan Revolution was successful, depending on how you want to define these things. And then the Salvadorans figured, well, we're next. And so they started doing the, following the same models and organizing them the same way. And you had CISPUS here in the neighborhood, the, the um, Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. And so you also had a very left-wing gay movement, and that most of the left-wing gay movement died in the AIDS uh, apocalypse, essentially. So you had, now you think of gays and gay politics, it's, there's not that many radicals that you get excited about. You start to think, oh, there's a bunch of real estate people who <laughs> own the Castro district, right? And then there's some flamboyant people in various nightclubs, but it's not really like a sense that there's this popular movement around challenging sexuality and challenging families, but it was like that in the 70s, and this neighborhood was a place where that really flourished, particularly along Valencia Street. Today, Valencia Street feels kind of horrifyingly gentrified, but in 1977, 78, that was the heart of the lesbian community, and there were half a dozen b lesbian businesses along L Valencia Street during that time, and the other population that came in at that period in 79, 77, 78, 79 was the punks. So suddenly you had all these underground punk clubs and you had this lesbian scene and then the women's building gets bought and it's a really dynamic place. And if you go and see those, there's movies that you can see, like there's a Hollywood film called Milk about Harvey Milk. And it, they show you this really important thing that happened in 1978, which was the Briggs Initiative. There was a ballot proposition statewide in California to ban gays and lesbians from being teachers. 
And everybody was sure it was going to pass. It was just like, you know, right wing California. At that point, it's still the state that brought us Reagan and brought us Nixon. It's like, you know, this is going to go. And the Har Harvey Milk was very important for telling, coming out very publicly and saying, look, if you're gay and lesbian or you know somebody who is, you need to come out of the closet now and talk to everybody you can talk to and make it clear to them that this is not unusual, that we're your neighbors and friends, and this is a completely horrible thing to let this go through. But what's missing from the movie Milk, there's no women. There's almost no women in the movie at all, period. And then the reality of the matter is, is it was uh, Sarah, Sally Gerhardt and a whole bunch of the lesbians who were p highly politicized and highly organized here in the Mission District who organized a statewide campaign that ended up going door to door all over the place, like in Fresno and Bakersfield and all these places. And the election night came in 78 and it was just, people were just hugging and crying. They couldn't believe it because they had won the election 53 to 47. And it had repudiated the Briggs Initiative. So it was really shocking. Like we were just like, wow, what a, what a relief, what an incredible victory. So uh, Harvey Milk, of course, got elected supervisor during that era and then got assassinated at the end of 78, along with uh, the mayor <coughs> by Dan White. And so all that stuff was kind of hanging over the whole city, but and not so much for the Mission District. But um, there was this ferment and all that, all these pieces are part of what made the Mission District what it is today. And then there's a lot of people who were lived through that time who still live here who are quite adamant that that's the definition of the Mission District. But then if you talk to people who have arrived here more recently, they're going to be like, oh, no, it's Google buses and it's going to work all the time and being at work 70 hours a week and making lots of money and buying a nice condo and uh, having really good restaurants. That's what the mission's about, really good restaurants. And so there's a nice piece done in the original dot-com boom, 2000, 2001, when it crashed by the um, San Francisco Print Collective, and it's a uh, kind of one of those sort of 50s style cartoons that shows a nice white couple sitting at a restaurant table and says, welcome to the mission, brighter, whiter tablecloths, <laughs> which kind of captured the problem back then, and that was nearly 20 years ago, so here we are. So those legacies crash into each other, those kinds of, I mean, there's different communities of people who have a very short life here, but yet are from another culture and have a very different idea of what they, how they experience the mission. They're either living in the streets or they're piled up in these SROs or in, in essentially slum-like apartments that still exist here. Or they're incredibly wealthy and they're here with their little baby and they're just changing the neighborhood and they think they've like, got to clean the streets up. It's horrible. They have all these people in the streets. But the reason these people are in the streets is because they have all the money. <laughs> you have concentrated wealth, you're going to have concentrated poverty. These things go hand in hand. And uh, some of us f understand that who live here. There are those who don't. <coughs> That's really interesting because like, it seems like this gentrification is sort of shaping the city now. Could you go more into that topic? Well, gentrification is a complicated concept because obviously uh, at, the, at the very surface level, it's about making things nicer. And so for a lot of people who haven't thought through what the implications are, they think, well, what's wrong with making things nicer? And I've even known people who take the flip side of that and go, yeah, keep it awful. To, to keep people from moving in that we don't like. Like go out and smash windows and keep it full of urine and needles and everything. That's great because the rich people don't want to be here. I'm not really that enthused about that for a political strategy. But um, I do understand that what you really have to understand with gentrification, and it's happening not just in San Francisco but in every major city of the world, is that it's a process of a deep systemic economic logic. And the deep systemic economic logic that we're living through today is the rise of a re, re the reemergence of a rentier economy that sees the best way to accumulate capital is by extracting wealth from housing. And so every kind of housing, from the very lowest to the very wealthiest, every single person, wherever you are in society, they don't really care how you make your money, they don't really care what you do, just you can do whatever you want, but you will pay every month as much as we can possibly take out of your pocket, and it's going straight into the banking system where it's accumulated in the hands of the wealthiest people. And that's the world we're living in. And gentrification is the social outcome of that, where you have the system systemic eviction and displacement of poor people and people of color, and their replacement by people who are you know, the desirable populations of the wealth, of wealthy. And so it's hollowing out the cultural life of the city. It's hollowing out the, the uh, political life of the city. You end up having this essentially um, 
sort of neutered and neutralized sense of urbanity. There's a very good article in the New Harper's, it's about the death of New York, and the guy goes right through the whole thing, and he could easily be writing about San Francisco, it's the same process. But everything that we loved about city life, everything that we loved about the mission, is teetering on the edge, and it's not likely to be here for a lot longer. There are various efforts afoot to preserve it, but it ends up being preserved kind of like a Potemkin village or a you know, Disneyland kind of version of it. So you have this Calle 24 Latino Cultural District meant to help get subsidies from the government, the local government, into small businesses that have been Latino owned and been here for a while. And that's great for each one of those individual business owners who gets a little money and gets to stay for a little longer, I'm glad for them. But the reality of the matter is, is that the Latino population of this neighborhood is being systematically evicted over the last 25 years. It's gone down a lot. We'll wait for the census numbers to come in in 2020. I bet we're going to be pretty shocked at how low the population has fallen. So the, the mission as a Latino neighborhood has already gone up and it's seriously subsided quite a bit as a, demographically speaking. But uh, in terms of self-identity and political identity and all that, that it still has uh, real life here, and there's still people who bought their homes a long time ago who have had multiple generations living here and continue to live here who have a, a pretty strong voice in trying to you know, maintain their sense of who they are here. But gentrification, uh, it's a really hard thing to resist because the problem is you can't resist it because by saying, I don't like it, I don't want it, let's just stop you have to actually challenge the, the biggest religion in the United States, which is private property. The ability of individuals to own property privately and not be beholden to anybody except for those who might buy it at a higher price is the problem. We need to have some system of community control over land, community control over neighborhoods, community control over how we live, and not just about residential property or how we live is how we produce life like how do we actually make things the, the whole every aspect of life like why do we take crap in drinking water <laughs> for instance you know I mean, there's so many basic things like who decided that did you no neither did i funny how do we how did the world get that way well let's puzzle that out and now we start pulling on that thread and we pull on another thread and we pull on it turns out that almost everything about the way the world is organized is wrong and it should be reorganized which means we need to have a democratic process to think about how to do that but right now, the only thing that really makes any decision is money. You have a lot of money, you get to buy politicians, you get to buy airtime, you get to have your voice uh, amplified, or you're stuck just spinning your wheels. And, and I mean, another, I'll give you a case, case in point around the problem of, of sort of gentrification and, and uh, individuals, because it's, it ends up being a lot of individual personal, personalizing blame going on, like, oh, you're, you're wealthy with that fancy baby carriage, you're the problem. No, not really, that, that, I don't agree with that. Or, you know, the flip side is to blame poor people for causing problems. No, in either case, is that the right way to look at it? It's not a personal issue. It's not a personal failure. It's not a moral issue. It's an issue of how we systemically organize life. So there was a woman that came to one of our talks in 2006, 12 years ago, from Bayview Hunter's Point. It was a discussion on black eviction, uh, black exodus, black eviction was the title of the talk. And we went through the whole panel and we had people speaking about it and it was very eloquent and well done. And then this woman, who's very elderly, stood up in the audience at the, right at the beginning of the Q&A, and she said, well, I have a question. I bought my house in 1963 down in Bayview for $29,000, and I could sell it tomorrow for $950,000. Why shouldn't I? And that's your gentrification problem, <laughs> in a nutshell. Because as an individual, she should. It makes all the sense. Go back home to, she wanted to go back to Oklahoma and have, buy a nice four-bedroom house and, you know, finish her life in a better place for herself. And there's no reason in the world why she shouldn't have that right to do that as an individual. None of us would dispute that. But if you want to talk about the African-American community, or in our case in the mission, the Latino community, do, do people have an obligation to hold on to their property and stay here on behalf of some mythical community? Evidently not. But that's something that we might take on as a political mission and try to actually discuss how would we have a politics of community that actually <laughs> had some teeth, that actually made some sense, that actually affects life, not just sort of rhetorical blather that we usually rely on. So that's my gentrification answer. How would you map San Francisco in terms of activism or areas or groups or anything like that? 
Well, we're living at a, at a time when most of what would have been mappable has gone, has left already. There are still some interesting things going on. There's certain, certainly there's networks of friends who have a, a history, a legacy of doing things together over the years, whether they're, so I know of some affinity groups who have roots in the anti-nuclear movement of the 1970s. <coughs> certainly a lot of anti-gentrification activists here in the Mission District over the years. Um, there's the anti-eviction mapping project, for instance, that just recently staged the um, piling up the scooters in front of the Google buses. Just a, few, a couple weeks ago, I, I went out for that. I got a private text message from you know the private network saying, "Don't put this on social media, but if you want to participate, come up to this thing at eight o'clock on you know whatever it was Thursday morning." So I did, and you know that kind of stuff still goes on, and it's kind of like who you know if you're going to be in that in that milieu. Um, most of what passed for the formal left has died. There's still a few rem remnants of that around. There's the uh, re recently renamed, it used to be Workers' World Party. They renamed themselves the Party for Socialism and Liberation, so don't be fooled. <laughs> they're still Stalinists at heart. But uh, they're the, the core group behind the Answer Coalition, and they have their little office over here on mission between 25th and 26th. And they tend to, to show up at a lot of stuff and try to com d dominate. There's the International Socialist Organization. There's DSA, Dep Democratic Socialists of America. These are groups that are around. You could find out for yourself if you like their politics or not. I'm generally sort of uh, averse to a lot of formal left organizing. And I can go into that at length, but I won't, I won't bore you with that. Um, there are certainly people who still have a fantasy that the labor movement's meaningful. And there's, there are some unions in town that have some real strength in terms of uh, public workers primarily. And so P SEIU 1021 is a pretty strong union. Local 2 or has organized most of the hotel workers, so they have some real leverage in town. But the longshoremen, who were the backbone of radical labor politics here for 50 years, have mostly decamped to the East Bay and mostly have very few members anymore because so much of it's been automated through containers and cranes. Um, you know, the, the rise of Uber and Lyft is a good example of how little political response there is by, for instance, the Taxi Cab Drivers Association, which used to be pretty powerful, and now they've been rendered imp completely impotent by that phenomenon, and all the other drivers are all just watching their, their incomes fall while they compete with each other in a race to the bottom. Um, there's a lot of politics that focus on race. It's super important, especially for younger generations, to, to put that front and center at all times. And so I, I'm aware of different groups in town that are doing that. I actually have uh, our office for Shaping San Francisco is in the building at 518, 522 Valencia, which is an odd spot to be. It's just off 16th Street. And you would think, oh, my God, how could you be in a building over there? It's totally gentrified. But that building once belonged to the Communist Party of the United States. And so when the Communist Party fractured at the end of the Soviet Union in 1991, there was a big lawsuit between the West Coast faction with Angela Davis in charge versus the East Coast under Gus Hall and the old party leadership. And they eventually made a settlement. And the settlement was that that building, and the co I think it's a couple of buildings in Los Angeles, would be given over to these groups here on the West Coast who had left the party. And so that building then be became part of what was known, as it was, they created a new foundation, the Kendra Alexander Foundation, which owns the building. So it's permanently a building that cannot be rented or sold for anything but political purposes. <laughs> and so we have our offices in there, as does the Arab Resource Organizing Committee, as does the Freedom Archives, as do Mission Graduates, um, the Catalyst Project, various, they spend all their time doing uh, sort of white racism training sessions. And so there's that kind of stuff going on in town to, uh, you know, ongoing. But um, the, most of the politics seem to be fairly narrow in my experience over the last little while. There's certainly plenty of people who think of themselves as ecologists and environmentalists, but they always want to be very positive and they're doing things like, you know, park work in the parks or work on long, uh, digging up sidewalks and creating community you know, garden spaces along the sidewalks or actually working in community gardens, which is one of the more dynamic things happening in town is the, the ever-growing and expanding network of community gardens where people grow food and meet each other and have new relationships. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, the snapshot is it's always disappointing to me. You know, I mean, I, I would like to think there's you know, some groundswell of radical thinking and, and revolutionary politics, but no, <laughs> it really isn't. And uh, I don't think San Francisco is the right place to look for it anymore. If you're going to really dig it up, it's in Oakland. And even there, it's in deep trouble because of the gentrification process that's underway. In order to have interesting political movements, you have to have cheap rent. It's just that simple. You have to have places where people can live without spending all their time and money working to pay for their housing. 
but the model of our society has evolved over 25 years to a model in which you must work as much as you possibly can, leaving you no time to do anything else, because you have to pay such an exorbitant amount of money for housing. And so all your time, or your debt, or both. So either, everybody comes out of college and massively in debt now, except for those who are already wealthy. And then you get a house in a place like the Bay Area, you're going to be paying as an individual probably somewhere around $1,500 a month now for rent. It's insane. I mean, I for years and years lived paying $100, $200 a month for rent. Then I moved into this place and I was paying $450. My half of the rent of this apartment was $450. Now it's $600, but still, it's not that bad. <laughs> And that's to me just like normal, it should be that kind of uh, level, but it, that's way out of proportion to what most people's experiences and possibilities are now. So the model of doing, uh, you know, where would you find radical political impulses? You know, they come and go all the time in the everyday life in normal human behavior. You find ways that you engage in cooperation and mutual aid moments and act in solidarity with each other. Those are radical moments but they're not very organized and they're not very sustainable in an organized fashion if you don't have at least a certain number of people who have the time to do it. And if you can't afford to make that time because you spent all your time in the rat wheel raising money to pay for your housing or your debt or both, it's hard to see how radical politics reemerges. Sad to say. So I guess, I guess, I mean, I already know the answer to this question, but the question is, do you think public demonstrations are important and why? Well, I find them really depressing, but I also recognize that, that is that they have multiple functions. So on one hand, you often will, at a public demonstration, you might meet other people that you never knew before, and that's good. You know, that's where, that, if you don't go out in public, you for sure aren't gonna meet anybody, right? So having public spaces, are uh, quite important. And that actually um, is how really my sense of critical mass, the bike phenomenon, was much more interesting as a public space than it was as a bicycling phenomenon, because it was a place where people could meet each other and new initiatives could emerge from that. And I think that the, the normal leftist demonstration fails that mostly because it's very tightly organized with a stage and big amplification and really horrible speakers who yell at you and, and berate you for the political moment or whatever they're up to as though you were somehow the person who created, <laughs> you haven't done enough, you're not suffering enough, you're not working hard enough, that's why things are going to hell. It's like you're yelling at the wrong people, you idiot. So, you know, the leftist demonstration is a pretty depressing place to go and, and to feel like anything liberating could come out of that. But there's moments that escape that logic, you know, where people gather in a rather spontaneous way or, in a, you know, where they come together without that kind of pre-organized sense. And I, I have a lot of faith in capacity of human beings to organize themselves in a direct and horizontalist manner without having heavy-handed leadership and formal structures to do interesting things in the moment. But then, you know, once you've done that, you still need to be able to build some sort of continuity over time, and that's where we've continuously fallen short. So political demonstrations mostly are, uh, you know, they, they used to serve the purpose of checking power, right? Actually having the, some version of that going on. But for a very long time, power has learned how easy it is to ignore them, and they do. And so their I idea is if you don't elect a government that throws them out, then they're not going to pay any attention to you at all. So like, you know, we had 12 million people in the streets around the world on February 15, 2003, saying don't start a war with Iraq. And George Bush and Dick Cheney just said, we don't care. We'll do whatever we want. And then, of course, Trump's just a thousand times worse than that. But it's the same thing Reagan did in the 80s, too. So it's just, for a very long time now, since the, the Nixon period, there's been this separation between the population and its representation. And it's, it's so cavernous now, the space between those two things. We have a government of and by and for millionaires. They're all millionaires. There are no, nobody, I think there's 94 millionaires out of 100 in the Senate. And there's at least 100 millionaires in the House of Representatives, and the rest of them are all extremely well bribed. <laughs> So uh, the idea that there's anything remotely democratic about what's going on in our government is this crazy myth that I don't even know how anybody could repeat it with a straight face. It's so blatantly false. So political demonstrations that go out and have grassroots energy and p push them. I mean, you know, you've seen this huge amount of energy just the last week, right, with people being really upset about the family separation stuff going on down on the border, which is essentially fascism. You take people and you put them in concentration camps and you say you're, you're, it's for their own good or whatever the hell they say about it. That's 
that's fascism. I'm sorry. And we have you know this giant war machine with people all over the world bombing the, you know multiple regions of the world with military bases in 170 countries. This is what we live in. We are actually Germans these days in in a Nazi scenario, which you know it has different iconography, it has different rhetoric, but it's functionally very similar. Much more so. It's much more similar to being in Germany in 1935 right now than it is not. It's more. It's much closer to that. But it's very hard to figure out what to do about it. And I have friends just wailing on Facebook. I, you know, I've organized my whole life. I've done all these things, and I don't know what to do. Because the main thing you want to do is you want to go to those camps and tear the fences down and take people out and free them. And yet, it's very hard to mobilize to do that. So political demonstrations are uh, wimpy, self-congratulatory affairs for the most part, where people pat themselves on the back because they showed up. I feel great. I, I stood up. Yeah, you stood up and did nothing. You made a bunch of noise that nobody listens to and nobody gives a shit about. That's unfortunately the truth about political demonstrations. They still go. I still go. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've, I accept my frustrations and I go anyway sometimes. No, no, not, not always. I'm not a person that shows up at everything, but I do occasionally show up. Um, so aside from political demonstrations, you've also been in, involved in book fairs. Do you think those are a good way to connect and create community? Or is there some other, other reason why they're important? What, what was it? Book fairs. Book fairs. Hmm. Yeah, book fairs are fun. It's a great place to see your friends. <laughs> and meet some, you know, meet authors and chat with them and learn about books that you didn't already know about. So yeah, I think it's a space of intellectual, uh, public intellectual life. And let's be honest, that's in short supply. So there's not very many opportunities to meet other people who are thinking and writing about the same things you might be interested in. So I like book fairs for that reason. Some are better than others. I, I went to the Anarchist Book Fair for years and had a table there for a long time. And then more recently, the Howard Zinn Book Fair has just become a phenomenon. And I kind of like the Howard Zinn one better because it's very frustrating to be around anarchists because of how they, they're not very intellectually challenging. Leave it at that. <laughs> So yeah, book fairs, are, they, I think they have a purpose, for sure. And I mean, it's not just book fairs, but it's fairs, it's public, public gatherings, you know, like we need to have, we need to be more creative about thinking about reasons to gather in public, whether they're block parties or street fairs. The street fairs have been turned into alternative malls, but you know, you could think about one that's not dominated by commerce. That's really the point for me, is to try to get out of places that are dominated by commerce. Book fairs are ironic because they really are dominated by poor, all those poor booksellers desperately trying to sell books when this is such an unfriendly society to reading and, and book, book dealing. But um, it's also a place where there's a lot of discussion and, and open you know, debate, which we don't have nearly enough of. So I like those for that reason. Um, what would you consider the most important public knowledge that should be shared with the community to preserve SF as a city for the people and not for the corporate forces. I know that's like, it might seem like it's too late, but is there anything well, of that never, sort? I don't think it's too late. It's never too late. Like we're still here, we're still breathing. It's not too late. But it does require um, a more rigorous and thorough systemic approach as opposed to the sort of flailing issue by issue, like stop that building and stop that bad behavior and stop being mean. And you know, it's like, that's not gonna do anything. But a social movement that starts to actually discuss the world they want to live in and how it should look and what would be the constituent pieces of it and how do you want to spend your days would be interesting to me. And I don't think it's impossible that that could happen. It hasn't happened in my lifetime. It doesn't mean it can't come about. Like I've basically been agitating since I was 21 years old for a politics, a radical politics around what we do. Like why don't we talk about what we do? Because what we do is making the mess. Every day we get up and we agree to keep doing this. Why don't we do what we want to do? Well, we don't ever ask ourselves that question. We don't give ourselves the space to even consider it. So I think that uh, there's a way of, that I can imagine a sort of incipient program for that alternative way of thinking about the world that, it, that is already everywhere percolating kind of in the ground of society and it hasn't found a political voice yet. But one of the expressions that it's had is this notion of the commons. And so we need to grow the commons, the commonwealth, and shrink the private wealth. And we need to take the private wealth from the people that control it and add it to the commonwealth. It's simple, it's a Robin Hood scenario, basically. 
And so, you know, they have been stealing from us like mad for 40 years or more. It really goes much further back, but really blatantly since the whole neoliberal turn, since under Reagan. And it's just accelerating. And this kleptocracy that runs our society is just astonishing in their brazenness. They'll just steal anything and act like they did you a favor by stealing it. It's just incredible. So we should steal it back as much as we can. And I, I think there's ways of setting it up to do that. But, you know, there's things on a, on a municipal level, for instance, imagine free broadband for everybody. Forget Comcast, forget AT&T, just you get free high-speed internet with no, you know, with pure net neutrality, no problem with controlling it from a private business. That's doable tomorrow. Like, we have fiber optic network all through the city. They could start doing that right away. And they're talking about doing it, but they haven't ro rolled it out. We should have free electricity. We own our own electrical system. Why don't we just provide ourselves with free electricity, or at least so cheap that it's you know easily maintained that way? Free water. I mean, free water begs the question of using it properly, because when something's free, people misuse it. So maybe you need to regulate it that way. But anyway, the idea would be to expand the number of things that are free, expand the amount of housing that's been decommodified and made into permanent cheap housing, not just affordable. I hate that word, cheap. So it doesn't cost you a lot <laughs> to live there. Free public transit. You do that tomorrow. There's a lot of things you could do that would lower people's cost of living rather dramatically, rather quickly, and that would build on itself and expand that logic so that people could work less and have more time to discuss and more time to argue and more time to make art and more time to engage in politics and more time to play sports and more time to do things that make you feel like a human being. And right now, everybody's on a rat wheel, and they feel like, well, this is, I should love my job. I have to love my job. I'm, I, I, do what you love. Okay, I'm going to love it. I'm going to love it. You can't love it. It's awful. Every job is awful. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're selling yourself to a job, you're going to hate it. It's only going to take a few weeks, maybe a couple of months if you're lucky, but you're going to hate it pretty soon. So the idea is how do we actually change how we engage in producing life so that it's not in the form of a job, because that is a really stupid way of organizing life based on selling yourself for exchange for money, and then you're supposed to spend your money to make a good political decision? That's impossible. You already produce a world that's completely fucked up. How are you going to buy the right thing that's going to undo that? Not possible. So there's a way in which the, the, the long-term political shift of our culture has moved us away from thinking about our ability as producers to produce the world we want to live in. And we don't even think about it, and we don't engage with it subjectively or you know, communitarianly or anything like that. Instead, we just sort of accept that, well, I just have to do best for me, so I'm going to get the best job I can that pays the most money that I love the most, and then I'm going to spend it really intelligently and buy only the best shoes that are really made by you know non-sweatshop places, and I'm going to buy their healthy food, and I'm going to treat people that I interact with really well, and that's going to be my contribution. I'm just going to do my part. That is completely inadequate. It will not solve a thing. It's going to keep the world exactly as it is, and you'll just be one of the lucky rich people who can make those decisions. But the vast majority of people don't have those decisions to make. So we need to have a politics that grows the common wealth. And the wealth is there. It's all around us. Most of us don't have it. Is there any th last thing that you'd like to add or talk about? No, I think I covered quite a bit. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for sure. talking to us.